nuestro próximo conferencista. Kush Vashni es miembro del personal de investigación y gerente de IBM Research AI. Trabaja en el centro de investigación Thomas J. Watson en Nueva York. Es embajador de datos en Data Kind en Nueva York. Estando en el MIT, fue asistente de investigación del grupo de sistemas. Es miembro de Eta Kappa Nu y Tau Beta Pi y miembro senior de IEEE. Recibió un premio al mejor documento de viaje para estudiantes en la Conferencia Internacional sobre Fusión de Información de 2009. El premio al mejor documento en la Conferencia Internacional sobre Operaciones de Servicios y Logística e Informática en 2013. La conferencia de hoy. Artificial Intelligence, Data Science and Global Pandemics. Bienvenido, Kush Vashni. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kush Vashni, and I'm a distinguished research staff member at IBM Research. Uh, I'm based at our TJ Watson Research Center in Yorktown Heights, New York, in the United States. Uh, so I'll be telling you all about artificial intelligence, data science, and global pandemics. So let's start with the first two, artificial intelligence and data science. So as we all know, um, there's been a steady increase and kind of explosion in the amount of digital data that's available these days. And uh, a lot of development in artificial intelligence by which Uh, we are able to use AI um, in many different settings, whether it's for recommending movies or um, in the finance uh, setting or uh, recommending friends on Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, but it turns out that there's actually a role for artificial intelligence and data science in uh, mitigating and managing global pandemics. Of course, we're all in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this is a general sort of statement though. Um, and hopefully we can uh, prevent and manage um, any future pandemic that might arise as well. So there are four different stages or four different components to um, how we can use AI um, for managing and mitigating pandemics. Uh, so that includes surveilling, testing, managing, and curing. Okay. So in the category of surveilling, um, the first thing that we can do using AI is uh, to predict um, which potential pathogens, so viruses or bacteria, um, are possibly zoonotic. So zoonotic means that it's a disease that um, is in animals and can jump into humans and infect us. So there's thousands and thousands of viruses and um, bacteria, uh, but very few of them have the ability to jump into humans. So um, one way we can use AI is to predict which ones of those uh, possible pathogens can become human diseases. A second category is uh, informed spillover surveillance. So once we know that a pathogen is zoonotic and might have had an outbreak in the past, um, it's important to monitor it for future outbreaks or future spillovers. And the main task here is to predict which species of animals can be the reservoirs um, or hosts for that um, pathogen uh, so that we can make sure that humans aren't in contact with those animals and at risk of uh, getting the disease. And then the third topic in surveillance is early warning. Uh, so once a new outbreak has started, um, it starts very small, um, actually just with one patient um, before spreading almost exponentially. Right? Um, so the earlier we can have the warning that the outbreak is starting, the more actions we can take to limit it. Um, so the next category is testing. So once there is an outbreak, uh, we can use um, uh, different techniques to test people to see whether they have a disease or not. Uh, so early in the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a big issue that there were not enough tests to test everyone who might be at risk of, uh, of the disease. Uh, so there's methods based on group testing 
in which you can smartly pool together inputs. Um, so smartly pool together the nasal samples or blood samples from different patients and be able to test many more people using a fewer number of tests. Um, so that's a, a technique also that we can say as part of AI. All right, um, second thing is using deep learning or uh, deep neural networks to analyze images of the lungs and other parts of the body um, to see whether a patient has COVID-19 or not. Um, so with this, um, uh, we can certainly have human radiologists analyze those images, but when we use machine learning or AI uh, to do the same task, it can be done at a bigger scale. Um, but the problem is that we have not yet actually had any example, whether related to a pandemic or not, where uh, any of these uh, imaging AI technologies have really been used in clinical practice. So there is still a gap between um, what happens um, in the lab and what happens in, in among clinicians. Okay. Another example of a similar one is to actually uh, look at the audio signal. Uh, so the breathing patterns of a person also indicate what sort of disease, um, what sort of respiratory disease they might have. And there's a particular signature for COVID-19. Uh, so we can use uh, artificial intelligence to uh, analyze these uh, signals as well. The third category is on managing the disease. Uh, once the outbreak is uh, spread and is um, kind of uh, widespread, uh, we can do spatiotemporal epidemiological modeling. Um, so here we're trying to model um, how many cases there will be in the future, what the spread will be, and so forth. Okay. Uh, second uh, role for data science is um, to drive decision making whether those are primary uh, pieces of information like the number of cases, secondary information like where there are hospital beds or um, protective equipment or uh, tertiary um, uh, sort of data related to the general infrastructure and using it to inform strategic decisions like uh, do we need to um, build a new uh, hospital bed uh, or new hospital uh, in the field, for example. And finally, um, when there are outbreaks to manage them, it's important to engage the public uh, to inform them of best practices, uh, to limit person-to-person -person spread of the disease, which might go against uh, various cultural practices, and also to receive information from the ground, including contract tracing. And there's roles for data science and artificial intelligence in this aspect as well. And then finally is the question of how to cure the disease. Uh, so there's uh, one effort which is called drug repurposing. Uh, so here the idea is to take old drugs that have been used for other diseases in the past and see if they can be used um, for the novel disease that we're facing now. Um, so that is a good thing because uh, these old drugs are inexpensive and their safety has already been proven out in the past. Uh, so one way to use AI in this process is to um, uh, search through publications from the past uh, that indicate maybe there is a role for um, a particular drug to be repurposed. Uh, second example um, in this curing category is to use AI to generate and discover new drugs. Um, so completely new drugs for new diseases. And there's ways of using machine learning for accelerating this process. And then finally, something that might seem strange to you um, to hear about as part of curing uh, a pandemic, um, but it's related to the socioeconomic recovery. Um, so a big issue with a pandemic is the disease itself, but an even bigger issue is that it uh, creates a lot of uh, economic issues. Um, people are without jobs or um, are uh, kind of struggling with, with their savings. So how to get them back on the right track is uh, another important part of curing society from the effects of the pandemic. 
So in the remainder of the talk, um, I'll go into a little bit more detail about a few of these topics, um, starting with informed spillover surveillance. Okay. Um, so we did a project a few years ago before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which was related to Zika virus. Uh, so Zika virus had been known in Africa for the last 50 years, and it had just uh, come into South America. Uh, so I don't think it was uh, much in Chile because um, uh, there aren't any primates really that live in Chile, um, but in other parts of uh, South America, um, especially in Brazil and uh, Colombia, um, there's a lot of primates. And what Zika virus does is um, it hangs out in uh, various sort of uh, monkeys and other primates, and then uh, mosquitoes will come by those animals. Um, those animals don't get sick, they just host the virus, and then the mosquitoes will go bite a human, and then the human will get the disease. Okay. Um, so what we wanted to do was to predict um, what are those primates, those monkeys, um, that are reservoirs for Zika virus. And the data that we had was uh, the knowledge of which primates are reservoirs for a whole family of um, viruses, uh, of which Zika virus is one, um, in Africa. So those other viruses include uh, dengue, um, West Nile fever, yellow fever, um, St. Louis encephalitis virus, and so forth. Um, so these were um, a way for us to get an understanding of which species of primates could be reservoirs for these other diseases. Um, but what was not known was which um, uh, of those primates would be reservoirs for Zika virus in South America. Um, so what we wanted to do was build a model um, based on the behavioral and physiological characteristics of primates uh, in Africa and which ones are the reservoirs. And from that, we can um, then predict in South America, what are the, um, uh, the reservoir species. So based on this uh, model that we created, um, uh, there's about 200 or so primates in South America and Latin America in general. And uh, from those, uh, these were the top six predicted reservoir species for Zika virus. Um, so two of them, uh, or three of them, sorry, um, were already known reservoirs for yellow fever. And one of them was already a known reservoir for St. Louis encephalitis virus. Um, and then what happened was we plotted these, the ranges, the geographic ranges of these um, uh, predicted uh, primate reservoirs. And in the map of South America, these black dots are the cases of uh, Zika virus and they match very well with the ranges of um, where some of these primates live in uh, Colombia and um, Brazil especially. And then after we did our work, um, some field ecologists um, actually found and captured some monkeys in the wild and tested them and found them to be positive as reservoirs for Zika virus. Um, so one of them was uh, number five on our list, Calothrix jacus. Um, which is a great um, sort of validation of our model that something um, very high in our model was um, found to be an actual Zika virus um, reservoir. And then the second one that these field ecologists found um, was uh, this uh, species uh, Cebus libidinosus, um, which is very closely related to um, species numbers one, two, and six on our list. Um, but it contained a lot of missing data in its features. So it's not surprising that it did not show up at the top, um, but it's again validation that it's closely related to these other species that, uh, that did. And just the fact that um, we don't know whether, um, or we didn't have field ecologists who found these other species to be reservoirs, doesn't mean that they're not. Um, it's still possible that they could be. It's just, it's very difficult to capture um, uh, monkeys in the wild and find the one animal that is positive for a uh, given virus. Okay. Uh, so second example in the surveillance is on early warning. Um, so here, um, again, I'm talking about an old project of ours from a few years ago. Um, and it was in uh, collaboration with this organization called ACAPS, which um, 
uh, quickly gathers and summarizes information and releases it um, for other aid agencies to use in uh, designing their responses. So they've also been very um, active in the uh, uh, response to COVID-19. So here's an example of a report that they create. Um, and so here it is for, for the impact of COVID-19 on Yemen, for example. Uh, so what we created for ACAPS um, back then was a way to automate uh, the collection of news reports and other reports um, that are relevant for a particular crisis um, or humanitarian crisis. Uh, so what we did was um, create what's called a focused web crawler, um, which will find exactly the articles um, in the news and in other reports that are relevant uh, for the particular crisis and summarize um, information about them. And this allows analysts to spend their time doing higher level tasks rather than um, the mundane work of combing through news um, articles uh, day after day. Uh, so this would be an example of the results that we created. Um, uh, so it will find um, all of these articles, find um, what sort of uh, crisis it is um, and where it is and, and so forth. And all of this information can then be used by those analysts. Okay. Um, so a third uh, example, um, so this is uh, from the curing category. Um, so this is about drug repurposing. So this is a project that we did in collaboration with an organization named Reboot RX. Uh, so in the past, there have been a few examples of uh, generic drugs uh, that have been repurposed for uh, use in cancer. Uh, so that was our topic of study um, before COVID um, started, but we then actually used the same technology in COVID a little bit with Reboot RX. Um, right, so there's an old uh, tuberculosis um, drug, um, BCG, which was shown many years later to have a therapeutic effect for bladder cancer. Similarly for drugs for acne and for morning sickness. Okay. Um, but you can see it took 50 years um, to for someone to realize that maybe this drug could be repurposed. And that was almost only by chance. Um, there was no systematic way to discover these things. Uh, so what we wanted to do with Root RX is to scale um, the repurposing of generic drugs for cancer, or you could repurpose them for other diseases, but um, here we were looking at cancer. Uh, so the idea is to um, uh, predict um, what might be there already in um, some paper um, somewhere, uh, then prove it out by conducting some uh, clinical trial and then make it a part of the standard of care. Um, so we were focused on the first part. Um, and there are actually thousands of scientific articles out there um, that talk about non-cancer generic drugs being tested as cancer treatments. Some of them are just um, news articles. Some of them are um, uh, academic papers about a single patient. Some are a bit larger studies and so forth. Right? And there are very few clinical trials that are done at a large scale. Um, that's what you would ideally want to do, but um, and they're very limited. So we wanted to find these observational studies, preclinical studies and so forth that indicate some uh, level of uh, effectiveness of a given uh, old drug on cancer. And um, doing this manually is very intractable. It can take years, um, at least several months to do this. Um, so what we wanted to do was use AI instead. Uh, so we developed this natural language processing pipeline, which will extract articles uh, from PubMed, which is a large database of uh, medical articles and other scientific articles, um, have a machine learning model that will filter them then it'll extract any cancer that's described in the article, and then also extract whether there was a therapeutic association uh, with the cancer and then what type of study it was. And all of this evidence can then be used to determine if there's any promising candidates for drug repurposing. Uh, so here's an example again. Um, so this is the article on top, and then what sort of information we can extract from it. So uh, whether it's relevant for our task, what drug it's talking about, what disease it's talking about, and 
what study type it is, and then um, whether it was effective or not. Uh, so in this case, it's an uh, old uh, diabetes drug metformin, which has some therapeutic association with ovarian cancer. All right, um, so next example in the curing category is about novel drug generation and discovery. Uh, so this is by uh, many of my colleagues at IBM Research. Um, and this is an example of uh, an overall uh, idea called computational creativity. So here we're using artificial intelligence technologies to help us uh, generate uh, completely new things, be creative, uh, things that have not ever been created before. Uh, so drug design is another thing where humans normally are the ones creating new things, uh, but here we can use AI to help us uh, generate new molecules um, and not just generate them by chance, um, but generate ones that are um, quite likely to be um, uh, both uh, effective um, as well as um, actually not toxic because with drugs, the biggest challenge isn't to find a drug that's gonna um, kill off a disease, it's that it's also not gonna kill us, right? Um, so uh, finding ones that are not toxic um, is, is very important. So uh, we actually also predict whether um, a potential molecule is going to be toxic or not. Uh, so we've done this and um, uh, early uh, in the, uh, during the pandemic, we actually released um, 3,000 candidate novel drugs for COVID-19. Um, and you can uh, go to this URL, um, covid19-mol.mybloomx.net, and actually play with um, these molecules and uh, kind of see what the uh, algorithms were able to generate. And we actually um, then sent these um, uh, molecular candidates uh, to some uh, laboratories to test, and uh, some of them actually are, are uh, quite promising. And this is part of a larger effort um, uh, that uh, IBM Research led called the uh, COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium in which um, uh, several uh, drug uh, candidates and other tasks related to COVID-19 have been uh, looked at. And finally, um, in curing, uh, let's talk about socioeconomic recovery. So um, how do we get people who are now um, uh, out of jobs uh, or in very poor sort of situations um, back on their feet? Okay. Uh, so this again is a project from before COVID um, in partnership with an organization named Neighborhood Trust Financial Partners. And what they do is they help low wage workers manage their finances. Um, so they already had an app called Wage Goal, in which uh, the system predicts when a person's uh, savings will drop below zero. And in the US at least, um, there's a big problem called payday loans, which are a predatory sort of scheme in which if someone really needs uh, a little bit of money to um, uh, uh, for some reason, um, that, and they haven't been paid yet, so they've earned, let's say, um, uh, the money, uh, for, but they haven't had their paycheck received um, because it only comes every two weeks or every month, um, then uh, uh, these short-term loans um, people charge mean large percent interest and so forth. So what Neighborhood Trust Financial Partners has done is um, they created uh, these favorable financial products which let you borrow just for two days or three days against the wages that you've already earned but haven't received. Um, but they also help you um, decide that maybe these are some expenses that you don't need to um, incur and you can kind of um, uh, push them off. So uh, predicting when you'll go below zero in your savings account is a very important task. Um, so the way they were doing it, um, and they were predicting that uh, you might spend this much and this much and this much on these on these sort of um, uh, expenses, and then um, your balance will drop below zero um, at this date. Okay. Uh, so what we did was um, we actually looked at um, historical transactions data and wanted to have a better predictive model um, so that uh, we can do an even better job than what um, uh, Neighborhood Trust was already doing. And so the way we approached it was to um, uh, find similar spending patterns from that same customer or other customers in the past 
um, and then use those to predict forward um, what the spending pattern would be. And using our approach, um, uh, we were able to um, get much better performance um, in terms of uh, how much uh, the person's uh, spending uh, will uh, will be, and uh, also when and um, by how much uh, it will drop below zero. So um, this was much more useful um, for uh, for neighbor trust to advise their uh, clients, and we were also able to um, uh, advise them on what changes they can make uh, to their spending patterns. Right. So um, overall, um, there's many roles for artificial intelligence and data science uh, to play in global pandemic mitigation and management. Uh, those include uh, various uh, techniques for helping with uh, disease surveillance, uh, for testing for the disease once it's already out there, uh, for managing the disease um, in terms of infrastructure and other decisions that have to be made and uh, different techniques for helping us cure these diseases, um, uh, whether it's by repurposing drugs, finding new drugs, um, or uh, helping society cure itself from a socioeconomic standpoint. So um, thank you for uh, listening and hopefully this was informative and maybe inspiring for you to um, uh, get into the artificial intelligence and data science um, sort of domains and uh, maybe apply those, these techniques to um, uh, areas of, uh, of societal benefit. So thank you.